welcome to another segment of the Pastor's Brief. Uh, just this this time that uh, we can kind of talk a little bit, I guess, well, not really talk, I guess it's kind of a one-way conversation going on, but this is an opportunity for me to, uh, outside of the pulpit, uh, just speak to the congregation, speak to you, the people, the sheep, kind of shepherd to sheep um, sort of way. I really wanted to get this out there. Uh, this is going to be a little bit longer uh, segment because I wanted to remind and address something that we, we looked into this this last Lord's Day when we were gathered together, as well as get out the, the new book of the month and uh, kind of take care of that sort of business. Um, those of you who are not able to attend this uh, this last Lord's Day, we, at the very beginning of the service, took a minute to address um, something very serious, something horrific that is happening all across our land at an alarming rate. And I wanted to uh, just get that out there. I wanted this to be a, a permanent stamp um, on you, the people of Calvary. I wanted this to uh, to be out there, something that can be gone back to and referenced. Um, th- this needs to, to burn in our mind. Last week in the state of New York, the state legislator, legislature um, passed a bill which was almost immediately signed into law allowing for the slaughter of children, the abortion of babies, up unto the moment of birth. Full term pregnancy abortion is now legal in the state of New York and is funded by the government. If you cannot afford to kill your own child, the government is more than willing and more than happy to aid you in that process. This is nothing nothing less than the wholesale state worship of Molech as we read in the Old Testament. This is the state religion of the land in the United States of America. Uh, We took a moment to address this. If your heart is not breaking inside of you, um, in, in light of this, there's something fundamentally wrong. You must understand what this means. This this is going to uh, be popping up all over the place. Um, it doesn't take any sort of uh, deep insight to recognize this for the evil that it is. Uh, just the, the pure, unadulterated evil that it is. I do want to take... Uh, a few moments and reiterate what our response is. Um, this is, to be clear, this is not a political statement. Uh, this is not um, a, a, a stand for a particular political platform. This is a stand against evil. This is a calling out for righteousness. Let's make that very clear from the onset. There's three things three things that every Bible-believing, Christ-worshipping Christian must do. These are not options, and it's not take your your pick of the three. All three of these, um, as, as an American citizen and as a slave of Christ Jesus, these are things that we must do. The first and foremost is that you must, you must, you are on a moral level obligated to exercise your privilege, and I say privilege, not right, privilege to vote. We are blessed in this country with a voice. You must use it. You must use it. We vote in representation. If those representatives are too cowardly to stand for righteousness, or if they are advocates of evil, they must be replaced. They must be replaced. We are allowed the opportunity to do so. Take your biblical worldview to the polls and shout it with your vote. Those who stand for evil must be replaced with those who have a conscience. Secondly, you must be praying earnestly 
for the conversion, for the salvation of those who are in office, those who are making these laws. Um, it should come as no surprise to us that unregenerate men and women are behaving and acting like unregenerate men and women. God has given them over to a depraved mind. They are unhinged. They are unbalanced. They will continue to push their evil agenda as far as possible. They must be replaced or they must be converted. Pray earnestly for their salvation. Thirdly, we must be heralds of the saving grace of God. We must be heralds of the gospel, each and every one of us, everywhere we go. People that we come in contact with must hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the only, the only way that we will ever see any sort of significant change is through revival. And I'm not talking about just some sort of moralistic band-aid. Unless God changes men's hearts, none of this will change. None of this will change. Short of widespread conversion, this is not going to get better. But as Bible-believing Christians, we know the end of the story. We know and our hope is in, our faith is in the fact that Jesus Christ will return and will restore this world. He will reign in righteousness and justice. Justice for the first time since the fall will be known from sea to sea. And that is our hope. Our situation is dire. It is not hopeless. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in his return. Our hope is in his establishing righteousness. If, you're, if your hope is in um, our federal government somehow turning around, I wouldn't put any hope in that. We must take steps that we are allowed, legal steps, to ensure that righteousness is stood for, that righteousness prevails. When it fails, that does not crush our hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the gospel. Our hope is in his victorious return and righteous reign upon the earth. That is our hope. Now, allow me to transition from that. Allow me to transition from uh, another topic that's every bit as serious, hopefully not as solemn. Um, and that is the training, the well-being, the discipling of our children, of the next generation. God created the family. Uh, God created the church to function as a family, to function as a body. What's, the, what's the, the, the core of that, though, is the family. So what are we doing to train our children? That starts at home. This is a message for parents, particularly fathers. I think it's interesting that there is not a single biblical mandate for mothers to be the primary trainers of children. The mother, the wife, the woman of the household is to be a supporter of the husband, to be a helpmate. The primary spiritual leader in the house is the father. Don't expect your children to just get the gospel from somewhere. That's is at home. So much more than, than teaching them table manners, so much more than teaching them to read and write, so much more than teaching them how to brush their teeth and wash their own clothes and whatnot. All of those things are important. You are ordained by God to be the spiritual leader in your household, to be preaching the gospel to them so that when they grow up, they have a foundation they know what is right and wrong. They know um, the gospel. They know what God expects of them. They know that they are rebels against God, duly deserving his wrath. But there is good news. But there is good news. And so, um, as, as the church, how do we equip and help train parents, particularly fathers, particularly men, 
how do we best equip you for that? Well, that's why I, I want to kind of transition into um, February's. And granted, today's uh, still in January, but before we, we meet again, before we gather again, it will be February. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the book of the month, make that make sure that that's available for you guys. It's kind of a, a two-for-one deal. February's a, a short month, and we actually have two books of the month. And guess what? They're children's books. These are books designed for your young children. We have The Priest in the Dirty Clothes, and we have The Prince's Poison Cup. These are written by the late Dr. R.C. Sproul, and what these books do is illustrate and put the gospel, actually deep theological uh, issues, in terms that a child can understand. This book right here, The Priest in Dirty Clothes, one of my favorites, basically what this does is teach the doctrine of imputation. Christ's righteousness being placed upon us wretched sinners who have repented and him taking on our sin to be dealt with. That's a rather complex uh theological paradigm, a theological issue for you to teach your children, guess what? It is all within the pages of this book. And what I love about these books is that in the back, in the back is a guide, more or less, for the parents, questions to ask. At, at the um, end, the very first paragraph to begin this section, and the same is true with the Princess Poison Cup, um, is this paragraph. I just want to read it to you. We hope that your child and you enjoyed reading The Priest in the Dirty Clothes or The Prince of the Poison Cup. The following questions and Bible passages may be helpful to you in guiding your child into a deeper understanding of the scriptural truths found in this book. Some of the questions and concepts may be too advanced for your younger child. If so, consider returning to the story as your child grows in his or her knowledge of the things of God. This is... A book these are books don't read them just once come back to them use them as illustrations when you are reading from the Bible when you are training your child uh, we have this this is, is essentially the doctrine of imputation this teaches the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement Jesus dying in our place as a substitute to atone for our sin, receiving the full wrath of God. These are weighty concepts, but they're broken down so wonderfully. If you have children in your household, pick one of these up. We have several copies available. Read them to them. Talk through them. Use them as a, a training aid. Nothing, nothing is going to substitute the father sitting down at the head of the table or on the couch with an open Bible and reading to his children, to his family. Nothing will substitute that. But this, these are wonderful tools to come alongside. They're wonderful supplements for that. Cannot encourage you to pick up one of these enough. Cannot encourage you to read these to your children enough. Please do so. Um, the elders and I have, have talked at great length on how we are equipping men to lead, how we are discipling men to, to be the, the, the foundation of their family. The, the future of Calvary Baptist Church will rise and fall on, on one one thing, and that's faithfulness. Faithfulness in the pulpit to preach God's word, faithfulness in our studies to read and teach the word of God, and faithfulness in the families to train up the next generation. That faithfulness starts the pulpit, but it works all the way down to the, the, the family nucleus level. We want to help equip you to be faithful where God has placed you. And if you're a man, if you're a father, if you're a husband, that faithfulness lies squarely on your shoulders. We want to help you do that. Um, be praying for us as we 
think through how best to serve and equip and train the men of Calvary and know that we are praying for each and every one of you. Um, this, this, is, this is monumental. Um, this is foundational. And we want to be faithful in that endeavor. Looking forward to worshiping along with you this coming Lord's Week. Um, it is an absolute privilege to, to be here. It's an absolute privilege uh, for me to have this opportunity to, um, to shepherd you. Know that I love you. Know that I'm praying for you. Thank you.